Welcome to the API Dedox podcast. My name is Laura Wash, and this is a very special episode, one dedicated to accessibility and inclusive design. The following is the recording of my conversation with Susanna Laurin at the awards gala event last December, as she was the jury panel members overseeing the best accessible dev portal category. Susanna is a well-known ambassador and advocate for accessible practices. She is also a representative to the EU for the G3ICT and IAAP. I asked Susanna about her last impressions on API documentation and developer portals just before announcing the best accessible developer portal of the year 2023. I am deeply grateful for Susanna to have dedicated her time and attention to the awards program, and I hope you will enjoy and benefit from this conversation. Hi, Susanna, and welcome. I'm very happy that you could make it. Actually, incredibly honored. Can I ask that you, well, give a short list of all the titles that you hold and <laughs> how much influence you have on the shaping of at least the EU initiatives in, in accessibility? So thank you for, for having me and thanks for the introduction. I have been working in accessibility for quite a few years. I usually call myself one of the dinosaurs, so we need more young people to work on, on accessibility. But I do have a little bit of background and I am currently doing the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my whole career, that is herding the cats of the standardization organizations in Europe. So we have the Accessibility Act, the European Accessibility Act coming up in 2025 and the European legislation on accessibility works so that the law tells you who is going to be accessible and what is going to be accessible. But the real how is always kind of the technical specifications or the minimum requirements, if you will, is always produced in a standard. Um, so I've been uh, working on the EN301549, which is a super long name of, of the kind of, I think what is usually nowadays the, the most worldwide spread uh, accessibility standard for ICT products and services. And uh, that is now acting as the presumed conformance for the Web Accessibility Directive. And now we are mandated by the European Commission to gather all the standardization organizations and work together on updating that standard so that it meets the requirements of the Accessibility Act. And we are currently updating three existing standards, developing three new standards, and also updating two technical reports. So we have a little bit to do. But so that is my standardization hat. I'm also uh, leading the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. So the, the a member organization and not profit member organization that is a global organization with 5,000 members across the globe. Uh, I think we have more than 100 countries uh, represented now. So I'm leading the EU part of that of that organization. Uh, the headquarters is in, in the US, but but we think that the EU has a um, an important stake, of course, in this. And and then I'm my kind of day job is that I'm doing research <laughs> on on accessibility. So I've been working closely with the European Commission and and also many uh, end user organizations because. Because my, my background is really in, in kind of the, the close connection to, to end users. So, so that's some, somewhere there in the middle. That's where I am. Thank you very much. And I guess now when I said we are extremely honored um, and, um, and very, very grateful that you're embracing the award, I think it gets more depth to it in that, uh, that you took the time to look through these developer portals so that you can help us with direct guidance on um, what are the practices uh, that you saw and what would you say were positive surprises without mentioning names so we cannot give away at who won the award. I did not really know what to expect because I haven't seen anything like this before so I, I mean firstly I was very happy that there was a specific price category on, on accessibility in this kind of um, on the topic of, of developer portals so that was interesting to me and then the nominees were all over the place, very different, so a little bit tricky to kind of compare. But what I saw was that some of them uh, had a real commitment to accessibility, writing about the way they work with accessibility and really trying to explain how they do this and, and all of that. And you could see that they had a some kind of checklist on, on what they do, uh, while others had, you know, picked bits and pieces where they thought it would be, uh, this is a good practice and we would like to, to show this. So it was very, it was interesting to look at. Uh, and I've done many juror um, sessions before, but this was the most uh, 
I think to me um, most interesting because the 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 objects as I was looking at they were so different and and really their approach to accessibility differed a lot from each other. So I was surprised about all the kind of the different angles or perspectives of of how the teams have have been approaching accessibility. So that was that was really interesting, I think. And also, um, well, you put that very diplomatically, but uh, we had some back and forths because usually, in my understanding, accessibility audits are more looking for what's done not so well uh, or more punitive, whereas uh, the awards is very, very uh, strongly trying to be only appreciative. And this was a, this was a hard challenge for you uh, to turn uh, the usual way of looking at this completely around. Thank you for going with that right with us. Yeah, I think it it comes from the the US being have been in for many years uh, kind of the lead, the place to look for accessibility legislation and other things because the US have, have been doing this for a long time and their kind of the, the idea of accessibility is really about avoiding lawsuits which means that people get a little bit afraid of making mistakes. So that is, and, and that means, um, you know, looking for mistakes is kind of the, the essence of what many of the accessibility experts are doing in the US, unfortunately. And I think what we do better, if you will, in the EU and, and what we have always tried to do is to really look at accessibility, not as something you cannot do this and you must not do that. And that is forbidden and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of, uh, 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 uh. We, we don't want to be the police. We want to encourage people to do good things because during my 25 year, years in this uh, industry, I have still not met anyone who jumps out of bed in the morning and say, oh, today I'm not going to break the law. I do not think that's the driver. I think the driver is try to make your portal, developer portal or whatever interface you have as good as possible for as many as possible, maximizing the foreseeable use of what you're doing and making it good design. I mean, that's that should be, I think we just need to add a couple of, of kind of criteria to that to make it accessible. But just saying you can't do this, you shouldn't do that, is kind of, oh, it becomes so boring. And, and I really think we need to turn that whole thing around. And that's why I really like the award idea, because then you push for the positive things instead of kind of fighting the bad things. So so keep doing that. Let me turn that around, though. Um, are there, have you seen common practices that you regularly see that are not traditionally viewed as a problem, but you would consider them such? So yes, uh, the the international and EU uh, standards on accessibility, they are really minimum requirements. And I usually say that if you follow either the WCAG requirements or the EN requirements, the only thing you do is to ensure that it's equally bad for everyone. Very democratic, but it's not a very good goal to have. So the standard is a tool, but if you really want to make your interface useful, then you need to go beyond the standard. And I think um, some of these portals uh, use very clever things that we in the accessibility world usually call multimodality. So when you use more than one format or more than one channel, so adding text, illustrations, videos, for, I mean, different ways of communicating the same, the same uh, information or the same content, that is to me kind of the, the essence of accessibility, but that is not written in any legislation or any standard. It's just a better way to do things because, surprise, people are different. Some people are really good at logos and branding and they can, you know, they remember the design after one second and then, you know, but, but they may not be good readers. Other people like me, I'm kind of a text person, so I, I read well, but I have a bad eyesight and, and still others are better in listening and so on. So it's just the diversity among people. And if you provide several different channels or different format in the way you you provide your information, then chances are quite well good that you will reach a, a broader audience. And, and I really saw some of the portals doing that in a very in a very good way. We saw some presentations um, when uh, some of the nominees of the awards showcased their portal themselves that they mentioned that um, to this day they've, it's a challenging task to align aesthetics in, and, and content uh, in a way that it is inclusive to all audiences, no matter the disabilities. How do you, do you have any advice to maintain the visual appeal while ensuring that the content is accessible? 
I think that is one of the most common misunderstandings there are when it comes to accessibility. And I, I think it's because the first uh, criteria in the WCAG standard, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is usually where people kind of start looking, the first one is about text alternatives. So that means if you have an image or an illustration or something that reveal meaning, because there are people who are who cannot see that, you need to have an alternative. You need to describe kind of the purpose of that image in text. And then my impression, I don't have any scientific proof of this, but I think people read that and that in itself is so complicated. So then they kind of fall asleep. So then the other 200 <laughs> pages that they should uh, read, it doesn't really um, uh, stick to them. So the problem becomes always, or the kind of the focus become on visually impaired people. I have a visually impairment myself, but the number of people who are 100% blind is very small. And we have much bigger trouble with people who are hard of hearing, who have motor impairments, who have cognitive imp impairments or dyslexia. I mean, there's so many other user groups. So just focusing on the that, oh, what can I do with a visual? Because there are people who are blind. That is kind of that is turning the whole balance in a in a strange way. So if if everything needs to be, you know, if you only look at one user group that way, which is what is usually happening, then the risk is that you forget everything else. But 99% of your users will not be blind. So you need to do the visual appearance good and you need to work with the visual user interface, the user experience, everything we heard your, your colleagues talk about. That is super important for all users and even more for people who have difficult understanding, who may not be really tech savvy or, or have maybe a, a cognitive impairment and so on. That's even more important for them. And then we have this small group who doesn't see anything at all. And surprise, a good visual appearance and super cool colors and you know nice design, it doesn't bother them because they don't see it. So instead of thinking, oh, everything needs to be black and white and we can't use images because there are blind people, that's kind of that's that's going in the wrong direction, I think, because then we should all kind of stop looking at things and just shut out the lights. And I mean, we have videos here. That is not a disturbance to people with disabilities as long as we explain whatever we show with text. If we tell them, if we would have been um, showing a, an, an image here, then, then of course we should explain what is on the image so that people who doesn't see the image get that information. But we shouldn't shut down the videos because that is good for so many others. So I think that is kind of the basic it's a basic misunderstanding of what accessibility is. Good design is accessible design. And the visual design and the visual, the logic of the navigation, the way things are presented, the way objects are either in connection to each other or doesn't belong to each other, that is extremely important for accessibility for many, many people. And some of it needs to be translated into something that visually impaired people can also perceive, but otherwise, they just don't see it and you need to be clear in your, you know, in the text or the audio or whatever, the other, the other channel and format that you describe this in. But the visual appearance doesn't make a problem for people who can't see it. Thank you. I think this is, I hope this was the type of thing that you cannot unhear once you heard. You <laughs> heard <laughs> You said, uh, well, you think nobody wakes up deciding that they are not going to break the law that they, uh, we have some peculiar countries in Europe, so I don't know, but let's say, what would you wish people who are in charge of developer portals would wake up Monday and think when it comes to inclusive design? <laughs> Two things. First of all, uh, do consider people with disabilities as very good stuff. They have knowledge in their bodies around accessibility that you cannot buy any other way. So hire a person with a disability, that's a very good thing to do, not only to be kind of a good person to, you know, but, but it's a really, really clever thing to do. And there are many, for example, visually impaired uh, developers who are super good. So I, I would say, try to open your mind when you do recruitment, because that is really, sometimes uh, employers feel, oh, that must be difficult and how can I do this? But make a try. Many of people with disabilities are outside of the workforce because of our prejudice. So open your mind to that. That would be my first, my first Monday morning wish. <laughs> and then the other is, of course, realize that people with disabilities are already developers and designers and, you know, working with, with IT. So they should also 
be able to use your, your developer portal. Do start somewhere, even if you can't reach kind of the 100% perfect award-winning portal, but, but everyone can do something. So try to, you know, there are a lot of good um, free tools out there. The standards are free, free to use. Um, W3C has, has videos that you can look at, all the standardization organizations. You don't need to earn, you know, don't need to, to use a lot of money to do this but the basics you can learn the basics of accessibility and do kind of a stepwise approach try to make your portal a little bit better this year and then in six months a little bit better and and kind of be proud of being a little bit more inclusive so that that you will open up the fantastic world of, of development to to more people thank you very much susanna it was an honor also i'm extremely extremely honored personally to have spent even just minutes with you so thank you very much for that thank you, and I, thank you for having me i hope that all the things you said inspired many people and that the word will go far thank you for listening to the api the docs podcast we thank our colleagues at pronovis developer portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.